help not create churn because if somebody downloads something, you hit them too hard and heavy, um, they unsubscribe and then you don't get an opportunity to build that relationship. And then the goal of this workflow, uh, these campaign workflows for me is always to get them into a lower stage of the funnel. So it's all about them taking the next step. So if it's a top of funnel campaign workflow, the goal is to get them into some sort of middle of funnel workflow, some middle of funnel piece of content. And likewise, if they're in the middle of funnel, the goal is to get them into the bottom of the funnel. So, you know, I work in SaaS, I'm a SaaS guy. So a lot of times that's either re requesting a demo or signing up for a free trial. Um, you know, if it's for you or your clients, you know, you're probably going to have some other options, but just know like it's whatever that pre-purchase bottom of the funnel thing is, that would be the, the next step. And then these campaign workflows, the last actual step is I'll actually enroll them in a re-engagement workflow. So I'm assuming they've re gone through an entire campaign workflow, they haven't progressed, they haven't taken that next step, then I throw them into re-engagement. But I'll get into that in a second. I want to give you guys a quick example of what a campaign lead nurture workflow looks like. So here you can see, like, this is just an example of an ebook download. And you see, like, there's an email, and we wait a day, and then we have another email, then we wait two days. And that's kind of how this time decay model goes along. And you can see how it's one straight line. I actually don't have any branching in this one. And most of my campaign nurtures, I like to keep them very, very simple. Because um, I think the the guy, the, the key to being effective with this is to keep it really, really simple um, and not get too complicated with it. Um, and so yeah, I like to keep the campaign nurtures. Like, just know that each one of these lead nurture emails, the goal of that email is to get them to take that next step. So let's say this was a top of the funnel ebook. My middle funnel content may be a webinar where we dive in specific something that was mentioned in the ebook. And that would be, these emails would be focused on getting them into that thing. Or, you know, you may have multiple pieces of content. You could promote different ones in the emails themselves. But then you'll see that last step is enrolling, manually enrolling them into that re-engagement workflow, which I'll get to next. Um, and so this happens a lot. So as we all know, like most of the leads you end up generate, uh, you generate are not going to progress. And that's just how the whole volume game works. So a small percentage of them are going to meet the goal and go on to that next stage, but the vast majority are actually not going to convert. So they're going to fall into this re-engagement workflow. And this is why this becomes really important. So what a lot of people do when they don't have a re-engagement workflow is leads typically go through some sort of campaign-esque like workflow. They reach the end and then it just stops. So they just sit in the database. They never really come around to them. Um, then the re-engagement workflow gives you a chance to have another shot at those leads. And so as you saw on that, uh, that uh, quick gift that I put up there, at the end, you manually enroll them into this workflow. And what I'll do is I'll typically also pull in leads who have, say, you know, this obviously depends on you having a sales assisted, uh, I guess, sales cycle. So say like you pass someone off to your sales development or sales and like, the lead status, they don't make a connection or it's bad timing or something of that nature. I'll also have them pull into this re-engagement workflow based off of that status as well too. So if sales doesn't make any progress with the leads, it's like, okay, let's pull them back into our re-engagement flow. Let's see if marketing can warm them back up um, so that they don't just sit in you know, an SDR's queue and kind of go cold or anything like that. And these can be more uh, complex in structure. So the re-engagement workflow is where I get really complex with the branching. And typically what I'll do is when they're enrolled, the next step will actually be a branch. And I'll have a branch based off of something like life cycle stage. So it could literally be life cycle stage where you have, you know, were they in op or were they SQL, were they MQL, were they lead? Um, and obviously everything that comes off of that branch, you're going to tailor your messaging based off of where they were uh, kind of in their, their buyer's journey is really what you're trying to get to with that first branch. Um, so it may be something like, you know, if they were an opportunity, you already know, like they're really interested. They've talked to sales, they've made it really far in the process. So you don't need to explain to them what you do, or you don't need to sell them initially, essentially what you're trying to do is figure out, okay, they obviously went a different direction. If they didn't progress past op, what can I do to tell them about like new features we have, figure out what their pain points were. You may want to run a survey to find out, Hey, you know, why didn't you end up going with us? Like, Whatever that data is there, um, you're going to try to figure that out kind of in the beginning of that branch. And then as the, the workflow goes on, you'll do the same thing with other branches. So if they were a lead, you know, okay, they didn't progress to MQL. Um, they may have just needed more time to find out about our pro like the problem that our solution solves, or they need to figure out 
do we have the right feature set? Um, all those different things you kind of you know, worked off of those different branches. And I think it, the biggest thing with this initial branch is figuring out like, what's the best predictor for your business in terms of where this uh, contact is in their buying journey. So kind of marrying it to that. Life cycle stage is kind of the most widely applicable one, um, but there are others. Um, and I'll get into that too. And then I got a question, Mike. Oh yeah. Uh, got a question for you. So yeah. for the re-engagement campaigns, do they have to specifically opt in to the re-engagement workflow based on specific product interests or campaigns? This no. is from Jasmine. Oh, good, good. Really good question. Yeah, no, I'll uh, actually, let me click through to this. Actually, let me go back. I'll get into that in a second. But yeah, what um, they don't necessarily have to specifically opt in with re-engagement workflow. Um, assuming they've already converted on that form submission, you already have their opt-in. So that's why at the end of the campaign workflows, I actually manually uh, enroll them in this re-engagement workflow. And so for them, it's going to seem like one seamless journey. Like, They've made the transition within the workflow, but for them, they're just going to be getting emails. So they don't know that they've made this transition to a different workflow because it feels very seamless. Um, so yeah, so I just manually enroll them in there um, and then they continue getting the emails and the messaging and it goes on. Um, and then with this, like the re-engagement workflow, I change up the frequency here. So whereas like in the campaign workflows, we typically work off that time decay. So you're kind of hitting them hot and heavy closest to the conversion point. Once they get to this point, um, you want to give them those cooling off periods. So what I typically do is I actually operate on kind of like a pulsing frequency. So it'll actually start out, you know, space far in between. So it may be like one email a week and over time it'll slowly heat up and it'll go to like, you know, one every five days, one every three days, one every other day. And then it'll kind of slow down again to one every three days, one every five days, you know, it'll kind of go on in that fashion. Um, I find that that's really, really effective. Because what happens is in this re-engagement workflow, you know these leads have started to go cold. So you want to make sure that you give them that cooling off period. So as you go in, you can kind of go in, you give them that breathing room to say, okay, we're getting infrequent emails or just touching you every now and then to stay top of mind. And then you slowly heat up um, and get more, you up the frequency a little bit for a little bit and see if you can get them to progress and bite on another piece of content. Uh, then you slow down and you kind of go on on that fashion as long as you want to make the re-engagement workflow. Um, and it can be as long as you want it to be. Typically, I like to model it based off of the length of the sales cycle. So um, at SurveyMonkey on the enterprise side of our business, um, the sales cycle tends to be like six months. So the actual re-engagement workflow actually goes on for, um, I think, almost six months. Six months is a lot of time to cover. So I'm always building on it. But I think it's we're right about there now. Um, but yeah, if it's your sales cycle is 12 months or if it's three months, you kind of you kind of mirror off that. And then with the re-engagement workflow, the goal actually uh, is to get them to uh, engage with another piece of content that's at their same level of the funnel. So whereas with the campaign nurture, we were trying to get them to take the next step into like, you know, lower in the funnel, re-engagement then takes it and says, okay. They didn't take the next step forward. Maybe if they sign up for a webinar, I can get them to sign up for our other, our next webinar or another on-demand webinar. So you're kind of giving them more content at that same level of the funnel. Um, and as you get lower in there, like say if they, as you get longer, like, you know, um, you can actually do a step back. So I'll say if they convert on a webinar and say that's a middle of funnel webinar, they drop into re-engagement, they go into a branch and we'll actually promote, okay, you know, here's some other on-demand webinars, or here's another webinar that we have coming up that's live. And if they don't bite on those couple of touches, then I'll actually take a step back and say, okay, what's something a little higher in the funnel? So I'll promote, uh, you know, a guide or an ebook, something that's a little higher and see if they bite on that. Um, and the real goal with the re-engagement workflow is to see if you can get them to engage with another piece of content. Um, and so that's kind of the way you're kind of taking a step back and trying to figure out, can you milk a little bit more value out of those leads? Um, and ideally all of that content that you're promoting actually has its own campaign nurture, uh, associated with it. So as a lead, uh, then bites and says, okay, I'm interested in this other webinar. Then they get into campaign nurture based off of that webinar and they go on that same process. So that has its own like time decay. They reached in. They go back into re-engagement and they get back into this phase. So essentially leads can actually go um, around like a several times. So imagine like you're a lead, you're coming in, you're interested in content, but you're not progressing. 
you could go from campaign workflow to re-engagement to campaign workflow to re-engagement several times. Um, and that allows you to kind of maximize leads because if leads are still interested in content, you should keep them in the mix and keep working them. And so that's essentially how it works. So your campaign nurtures are feeding your re-engagement nurture, and then your re-engagement nurture is in turn feeding your other campaign nurtures. Um, and so that's why I kind of work on to kind of create that, that cycle. So it, it takes a lot of pressure off of your lead acquisition efforts. Cause if you know, like if we get leads where they're not just churn and burn, we put them through a workflow. If they don't convert, we're on to acquiring the next. You're kind of taking them and you're making sure people kind of go around this kind of cyclical fashion several times. So the only time a lead is truly like lost or like they're cold and you're not coming back to them is when like they get to the re-engagement. They're like, I'm not interested in any other content. I've consumed all I want to consume. And then you know, okay, they, they weren't going to progress. They weren't going to go anywhere. That's a lead that you can be okay letting drop out of your, your uh, system, your automation you've got going on here. Um, and yeah, so I know that was a mouthful. So yeah, if there are any questions, definitely let me know. But I'm happy. I have a whole, we all, we'll have a lot of time for questions. I promise we're almost to the end here. Um, but I do want to get into how a cyclical system of lead nurturing drives growth. And so the real important part of this is, um, you know, it creates real results. So part of getting to this point, like I was telling you guys earlier about driving this high level of pipeline is all about making sure we get the max value out of every lead that's generated. So you know, guys, I know most of you out there have seen it like generating leads is hard. You know, as people get even more concerned over privacy, like getting a name, email, you know, all that information just comes harder and harder. So I think it's important to build processes where if we get a lead, let's make sure we maximize lead value out of, out of that lead, whether they're on faster buyer journey, slower. We want to make sure that we, we get all the value out of them. And what this system has done, um, I've seen it create $1.3 million in lifetime value every single month, like clockwork. Um, and that's huge. And like a lot of that is not like, oh, we're generating a, a huge number of leads. It's just, we're making the huge value out of every single lead that we have coming in. So they're slowly, they're always getting work. They're staying in the cycle. We're kind of running them around, uh, time after time. Um, and I've seen it create $12 in pipeline for every single email sent, um, this is huge. This is one of the data points that I think was really interesting when I was diving into our own data is like, imagine like you send an email knowing like clockwork, every single one you send is going to generate $12 a pipeline. Um, and it's huge. That's huge efficiency. I think, you know, email is such an underrated channel, um, but building systems like this helps you create, turn it into that real money maker that I think people are looking for. Um, and email engagement has been really good. So I think, you know, one of the things that can be overlooked is we tend to get like, hyper focused on pipeline. Um, but one of the leading factors to getting pipeline is obviously your contacts being engaged. So when you're thinking about frequency and your messaging and all of that, that's really, really key to this. And like the whole frequency portion, finding the right balance there has led it to really high click rates. So 4%, um, I'm really, really proud of, I think that we've done there. Um, for those of you not super familiar with email benchmarks, like the, the, you know, typically you're looking at somewhere around 2% people would consider average. Um, so we're slowly building on that. I'm actually trying to get that higher, kind of work that up to five. But uh, yeah, I think, you know, engagement's a really important indicator when you're looking at kind of driving towards that, that ultimate goal, which is that pipeline, revenue, kind of money in the bank. So um, that's a really good sign too. And then I think, you know, why the system works. Um, it works because one, it's easy to manage. So despite like that long complication, complicated explanation of how they work, when you actually have it in action, it's really, really easy. So the po point of keeping the campaign nurtures, you know, simple and lin linear is that you can go in, you can swap out emails, you can dive deeper into smart content. It's really, really easy to manage. You don't have these multiple workflows all over the place where you forget what this workflow does or this big complicated workflow that you never get to work through and optimize. You keep it really simple so it's easy to manage. Um, and then it's flexible enough to accommodate any buying journey. So, and that's the other big thing. I think, you know, buying journeys, uh, in 2021 and going into 2022 are so dynamic. Um, you really have to have a system that's not based on how you would like them to go through the journey. It's just based on how they want to go to the journey through the journey. So whether someone like hits the website and it's like, okay, I'm already interested in this business. I'm going to grab this ebook so I can get a sense of what they're talking about. Then I'm ready to talk to sales. 
you're going to have those people and that's the system can accommodate that right so they download an ebook they take the next step and they quickly go through the process and get to sales or you may have people who are like i'm not even 100 percent sure that i have the problem yet so they download that same ebook trying to get a sense of what is the problem do i have it um do i want to pay for a solution so their buying journey is going to be longer and it also can accommodate that so as they go into re-engagement they get more content they learn more about the problem you solve then they learn natural nudges about your solution and how you solve it so it's flexible enough to accommodate any kind of buying journey you know how, how they go through it and then the best thing like what i love most about it is you can quickly iterate on everything so the frequency you can iterate on your CTAs, like I said, your content. You can do all of that and continue to work on it and improve it over and over. Um, something that's really, really hard to do if you have a lot of really complicated workflows and you're stretched thin. Like not everybody has like an army of marketing operations or demand gen people. So keeping it simple allows you to really get into testing, and that's where you really have the big wins. So I'll throw it, I threw out like some of the frequency I work on in terms of like time decay or pulsing, but there may be something else that we find very effective. If you have a really simple system, you can iterate on and test that really, really easily. Um, and yeah, I know. I feel like I've been talking for a very long time, so I definitely want to open it up to questions if anybody has any more out there. Let's see. Uh, let's see. Let's see if there are any questions. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Okay, let's see what we got here. All right. Oh, uh, yeah, Alex looks like he may, I can't hear him. Um, no worries. <laughs> um, let me let me pick out a question out here and let's see what we've got here. Uh, let's see. So Jasmine, let's see. Ah, this is a good one. Um, is there ever a time where they are getting duplicated content or they end up in the same workflow later down the line? Um, yes. So um, you may they may get duplicated content um, in terms of like the same thing that you're promoting. Um, it certainly can happen. Uh, I find that a lot of times that's okay because if you look at this workflow, um, as time goes by, just like ad recall, people have very low email recall. So even if you've gotten the exact same email like two months ago, you have no idea that you got that email. Like if you come back in, got the same thing. And then um, one of the other things that's going to help you is you keep it simple and you're iterating and you're constantly making small tweaks to the content. You can promote the same thing and you've just changed up the wording in your automated email. So it feels different, even if it's kind of in essence, the exact same message. Um, but yeah, I found it worked really well because I think, you know, a lot of times we kind of put pressure on ourselves. Like every piece of content has to be unique. They can't get the same thing again. But most people don't even remember. Like I have SaaS businesses that I love, like HubSpot's email. Like if HubSpot <laughs> sent out a newsletter that promoted the exact same five or six articles, I probably would notice, honestly. Um, but, <laughs> but yeah, I think it's, I think in essence, that's okay. <laughs> can you hear me now, Mike? Oh, yes, I can hear you. Okay. Uh, I don't know what happened. My screen just kind of stopped and I, I talked for maybe five minutes and nobody reacted. So I knew something was wrong, right. um, <laughs> but uh, I'm pretty sure HubSpot probably has sent the same, yeah. same emails over and it's, over. Exactly. Uh, but uh, what I was saying is we have, Ryan has a lot of questions about your data um, yeah. that you've kind of presented in this. Oh, so yeah. I'll start, I'll start kind of, um, well, he has a question about the Ryan, I'm going to go all the way back from your first question. Um, <laughs> you said 1.6 million created pipe, uh, created pipeline or closed pipeline. I think that was like yeah. in one of your early slides. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, that is actually created pipeline. So um, that's obviously we, um, I know everybody defines pipeline differently. So yeah. at SurveyMonkey, we define pipeline as an opportunity is created and a value attached by 
uh, an account executive. So our salesperson. So that would be created pipeline. Um, you know, I, I hate, I don't want to muddy data or anything. I'd have to get like what our actual close rate is, but just know like that's creative pipeline. So they obviously don't close all of that, but uh, we do pretty well with our funnel. We try to be good about quality over quantity. So um, it's probably pretty decent. I just don't have the number off the top of my head now. <laughs> cool. And then we have, and also has questions about your 4% click rate. Is that across um, all of your, seek, all of your, all of your workflows? Is that, um, you know, is that like email best you have? How are you defining that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that click rate is among across all of our emails. So that's uh, including like our regular scheduled sends, automated sends. Um, it kind of encompasses the whole, the whole gamut. Um, we track that together individually. Um, and yeah, so that's how, that's what we're looking at in terms of click rate. Cool. And then, um, you guys, if you have more questions off of these, go ahead and add them in. Uh, I'm kind of going through Royce has a good question is what do you do when a contact becomes a member of two campaigns? So if they're in your re-engagement and then they engage in one of your campaign workflows. Yeah. Um, you know, I know people handle this differently. Like typically what I'll do is all of the emails um, will have a frequency cap. So if somebody's like super interesting content, like I definitely want them to get the content within the different workflows um, and know that the frequency cap is going to keep the situation from someone who goes and says like, they download five different eBooks. They're not getting five emails on the same day. The frequency cap will, will make sure to take care of that. So I trust you kind of trust the frequency cap to go in and troubleshoot issues like those. And um, yeah, and kind of let them work through the process. Yeah. It's uh it's not super common. I find that like when we have contacts who are like, I'm downloading everything you have, they're usually somebody who's like <laughs> just looking to learn, or they're just trying another marketer trying to get a sense of like, what, what kind of content are they building? Like it's competitor or something, but yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to jump to uh, Adele asked one in the, in the general, in the general chat here. Um, when a lead is cold, do you delete them from the database completely or do you, or, or uh, keep them in case they resurface? Yeah, I know this is a, this is actually a really tough one. Cause I know a, there's a lot of thought processes to this. Um, I'll say that at survey monkey, um, they're, they're a big, we're a big publicly traded company. So we can afford to pay for contacts and have them sit in the database for a little bit longer and continue to work them. I'd say like, you know, figure out your own situation in terms of like, you know, I, I'm big about people not overpaying for HubSpot, but like a lead's truly cold and in the icebox, like make it a non-marketing contact, let it sit, not be one that you're paying for, sending emails to. Um, but yeah, it really depends on the company size. I'd say if you're big, you got a lot of money to spend, like let them sit, continue to work on them over and uh, over time and kind of figure it out. But yeah, if you're a small on the smaller stage, like you're a startup and it's like you are very conscious of like the, the monthly price that you're paying for HubSpot, <laughs> definitely don't be afraid to be aggressive with making people those non-marketing contacts so you're not paying for them. <laughs> yeah, that is a real that is a real thing. Um, yeah. <laughs> trimming down contacts. Yeah. Um, so so I'm going to read this just kind of verbatim from Ryan because I think he still might be unclear on the 4%. Um, yep. Is 4% of the people in the workflows who will eventually click click one email workflow goal tracking or is it 4% of every email is clicked? Oh, gotcha. So the 4%, sorry, I wasn't clear on that, is actually our, our aggregate click rate. So out of all the emails we send, 4% of them are clicked. Um, so I hope that adds a little bit of uh, clarity to that. I think so. And and in um, yep. right. um, cool. Yeah, seems like, uh, <laughs> cool. Ryan got that figured out. Yeah. Um, Royce, it seems like you have a second question that seems similar to the first, but I'll go ahead and read it. Um, what do you do in a contact that's in the nurture, but then engages with the campaign? I guess that's the same uh, you kind of answered that you'll, you okay. determine you'll let them either get both if they're interested or yep. potentially unenroll. Um, yeah. If it's, cause you can go either or, and like, there's not a, a, a you know, a, a real, like, you know, this is a set where it has to be. Um, yeah. If they're, you kind of go off of your database of content. Like if there are things where it's okay for them to get messaging about two things, say I look at a situation where you have a software, like, you know, Airtable, like where it has a lot of different use cases. And you may say, okay, um, they're interested in as project management and where they may also be interested in marketing campaign planning. So it's okay for them to be in two nurtures because these are different use cases. Like let's let them get that. 
Um, you know, if there are situations where it's mutually exclusive, you really want to focus in on them having one use case, then maybe you go in the, the unenrollment route if they sign up for a different campaign workflow. So I have, a, I have a question. So just thinking about um, the logistics of creating a six month uh, workflow with yeah. the different pulses. Um, yeah. Are, are you creating the emails yourself or is there other team members that are creating that content? Cause just thinking of a content creator, um, that's a lot of emails to <laughs> potentially create. Um, and I know you can probably repurpose and you can bring stuff back that you previously yeah. sent. Um, but Maybe yeah. talk just for a second on on that process. Definitely, definitely. Um, yeah. So fortunately, um, you know, I know where everyone works here, but you know, I'm at Survey Monkey, so it's a very, very big company. We have a huge team, so we like I've got a big content team that I can leverage for a lot of the email building. Um, you know, we have agencies that we can outsource work to if our our huge in house team that can't get something <laughs> done. So. We have a lot of assets in house to be able to do that. Um, if there's a situation where um, you know you guys are a little bit more strapped on time, don't feel like you need to build it all at one time. So before Survey Monkey, I actually worked at a smaller company uh, called Kinsta, which is a WordPress hosting company, and we were very tight. Like I was a one man demand generation team. I had one content person, so. Uh, it was a lot harder to build the workflows. And what I do is I just work on it in time. So I know that like, say it was the same situation, I'm working up to six months, I'll just start with like the re-engagement flow goes for a couple of weeks and I'll just kind of build on it in chunks. Um, and that's the great thing about workflows. You don't have to have it all set from day one. Like you can work on it in chunks. And I do it all the time where like I have a workflow and like I actually have contacts in the workflow as I'm building onto it. So I was, it's always fun because it's like I tell people like, oh, it's like a train. The train's running down the track as I'm actually building the track that the train's coming into. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love right? that. Yeah, that that's a good point. Is building that building those even those pulses in chunks. And, yeah. Exactly. Um, when, when you do that, do you re-enroll or or if if everybody who's in the re-engagement camp uh, workflow. If you add content, do you do you send that content to people who've already gone through the rest? Or is it only new contacts who come through? Yeah, typically it will only be new contacts. Um, I won't re-enroll them. Um, if there's new content, I know that they'll get it but through one of our ad hoc sends. So just like every other business, anytime we have a new piece of content, we'll you know send it out to the target set of the database. So they'll probably get it there. Um, and then obviously look the system. They download it, yeah. then they get into a campaign workflow, and they go through the whole process. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have a good question from from Sarah. Um, are the leads that don't work out when talking to sales auto enroll into the reengagement when property, or do they, uh, or do you have more criteria to meet first? Yeah, you know, typically what I'll do is I'll have them auto enroll when there is a status change. So it won't be off like the life cycle stage change. It'll be something like the the status or lead status. I know some people set up their own properties, but yeah, it'll be something like, you know, they made contact with sales and they'll say, okay, the status is now recycled because I haven't gotten anywhere with them. Or the lead told me they're not ready to buy right now. So it's bad timing. And I'll have it auto enroll as soon as they hit that status um, and have them plug into the workflow. Awesome. Um, <laughs> if there's any more, I'm, I'm going to make another quick announcement to say thank you to, for, to everybody. Um, HubSpot does have some free swag that they want to give everybody for joining. Oh. I just put the link <laughs> in uh, in the, the chat and I'll pin it to the, oh, I pinned the wrong one to the top. Um, so go ahead and check that out if you guys if you guys would like. Um, That's cool. So there's some there's some free free stuff there. And as I mentioned at the beginning, we are having a second uh, hug event next week for the San Diego HubSpot user group, and it's really all about organizing your database and keeping things uh, keeping things clean. And I think uh, Mike can probably tell you that if you don't have the right data, these workflows don't work as well. And yep. so it usually starts with a clean database. So I'm going to go ahead and put yep. that in there in the <laughs> chat as well. Um, yeah. That is December 14th. Yeah. Uh, so that's next uh, Tuesday. Nice. Uh, yeah. That, that's a really big problem. Like I find like even yeah. like at Survey Monkey, like we have a huge problem with organizing our account. Like because there's so once you get like so many hands yeah. in there, it's really easy. 
people oh, don't do yeah. naming conventions people don't put stuff in the right folders yeah. like it's a it's a whole thing <laughs> i mean even the fact that you you mentioned uh it, you you check you check different like lead statuses other yeah. contact properties and yeah. i have found that sales and marketing define and use those so differently yes. um, that if there's <laughs> not a conversation there um uh, right. I had a client that it felt like a therapy session between head of marketing and head of sales um <laughs> One was tracking on on SQLs. The other yeah. one didn't even use them. And so there yeah. were new SQLs. So marketing's like, we're not getting any sales qualified, but nobody was using it. And so right. uh, <laughs> that conversation is, is, uh, is a fun one. Uh, um, let's see if there's any more questions. I mean, like any question is a good question. Um, you know, Ryan did actually question about, do you know your close rate percentage on this channel on marketing? Uh, I actually don't know off of the top of my head. Um, yeah, let me, I'll dig into that. If you're really interested, um, definitely hit my website, uh, MikeKTatum, uh, dot com. Um, and yeah, grab some time on my calendar. We can dive into the day. Like I said, I'm not trying to be dodgy or anything. I just don't have the data in front of me right now, but yeah, that's definitely let's dig into it. Um, if you're interested, yeah, feel free to grab time on my calendar. I have a schedule right on my site. Yeah. Uh, so on that note, Mike, if you don't want to put your LinkedIn and your website in the chat, um, everybody go, you know, go connect. Mike has yeah, great content. Let me on uh, well. actually throw um, two things. So I got a new uh, new thing, I'm, project I'm launching in 2022. I mentioned earlier, I'm going to be running some HubSpot courses. Um, I'm really excited about, they're going to be similar to this, um, but really going step by step into like, how do you build these things? What are you building? Um, and that's going to be at that site I just plugged in there, mktgrowth.co. Um, definitely check those out. Uh, I got the first course I'm planning to launch in January, if you're interested. And I'm going to grab my LinkedIn uh, for you as well, because I definitely want to, to stay connected. Like, definitely, if you guys have questions or anything you want to follow up, definitely drop into my inbox. Um, it'll be a welcome change to a lot of the spam. I know that a lot of us get on LinkedIn, so um, it'd be nice to have some conversations there. <laughs> awesome. Well, if there's no more questions, Mike, thank you so much for, for joining us and yeah. I hope to, hope to have you again next year. Um, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Super excited. Yeah. Anytime, you know, I can help out. Just let me know. <laughs> yeah. And uh, on that note, to everybody who's still here, uh, we are starting to plan 2022. So if there's some topics, some things that you're trying to learn, you're interested in, um, feel free to share those in this chat real quick. Or you guys can always um, email me. I'll put my email in there. Uh, or or uh, just reply back to one of the emails that I'm probably spamming you with about upcoming events. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, we, this is a group for you, not for, uh, not for us. And so we want to make sure we hit topics that people want to learn more about. Um, so <laughs> I don't see any more, anything in the Q and a, I don't see anything else here in the chat. So thank you everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day, wherever thank you me. are or evening or night or morning. Um, since this is now worldwide. And again, Mike, thank you so much for, for your time today. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> All right. Bye, everybody. <laughs> bye.